Thanks a lot for the introduction. So, hi, I'm Remy, and you are here attending to my PhD thesis. And that for a PhD that was supervised by Benjamin Favier and Christophe Edouard. And so here I'm going to talk about a mechanistic approach to plankton migration. So first I'm going to introduce you to the world of plankton. Then we will formalize properly the navigation problem that we will tackle in this uh, study. Then I will, pro I will describe the solution that we propose in this, uh, in this study that is called the surfing strategy. Then we'll try to evaluate the performance of this strategy, in particular in turbulent flows. And then I will come back to biophysics to see if how relevant this strategy actually is for actual plankton organisms in the ocean. That said, then I will summarize a bit and I will talk about the perspectives of uh, this study. So first of all, let's talk about plankton. And so what are plankton? Actually, planktonic organisms are defined in a very simple way. Planktonic organisms are basically anything that are carried by ocean currents. Okay, so this can be anything, and not that one individual in this plankton group is called a plankton, and that's a word I'm going to use a lot throughout this presentation. Because this definition is very large, it actually includes a lot of different organisms, from viruses, bacteria, single cells organisms with uh, also microalgae, small millimetric animals, but also larger ones, such as slow swimming jellyfishes, or even just branches that are carried by the flow. Note that being carried by the flow doesn't mean that this plankton organism cannot swim. Actually, a lot of them can swim, and this is actually very important in the following of our presentation. Of course, I cannot focus on every possible kind of plankton organism, so I will focus throughout this presentation from the micrometric scale to the millimetric scale. Now, as fascinating as this, uh, as this plankton organism can be, why do we actually study them? Why are they important? First of all, they have an essential role in marine ecology because they are the basis of the marine food web. Meaning by that, they are actually eaten by a lot of different marine organisms that are themselves eaten by other larger plankton uh, marine organisms. Sorry. But they also have a very important role in climate, actually. So if we want to understand the dynamics of, plan no, dynamics of climate, we also have to understand uh, the dynamics of plankton because they have an essential role in the carbon cycle because they are a very important source of carbon trapping in the ocean depth. That said, now that we understood why studying plankton is important, let's try to see what they look like. So this is a typical picture that we can take if we try to catch some plankton organisms in the, in the ocean. And so we can see a lot of different things inside here, but one first thing that we can see is a lot of fish eggs, okay? But we also can see a very nice crab larva here, and this further emphasizes the importance to understand plankton dynamics, to understand the whole dynamics of marine ecology, because even though in their adult stage, these organisms are not plankton organisms, fishes and crabs, <laughs> and they will start their life in a planktonic, planktonic state. Okay, that said, we have a lot of other plankton organisms in here, and we have, for example, <coughs> copepods that then spend all their life in a planktonic state. Copepods are actually very interesting, due to their abundance and diversity, and, uh, and, uh, and they are even sometimes called the insects of the sea. So let's focus a bit more on this copepod as an example, a typical example of plankton organisms. So this is what they look like, a body, a tail, antennules. And because we're interested to understand the behavior of such organisms, we're particularly interested in their sensing capabilities. And one first thing that we can note is that they have a very rudimentary eye. So it's not enough for them to actually perceive the environment. However, it's enough for them to be able to measure light intensity around them. But to actually perceive the environment, they actually use these organs, these hair-like organs that are placed on these antennules that are called cities. And they can use these organs to actually measure local hydrodynamic signals that they use to perceive the environment. Then in terms of behavior, 
we can note that they have neurons, so they, they can display some very interesting behaviors, such as the one illustrated here, where they use local hydrodynamic signals to actually catch a prey. They can also use these local hydrodynamic signals to escape predators. But these are not the only interesting kind of behaviors of these copepods. Actually, they are known to perform what we call dial vertical migration. So what are these vertical migrations? Actually, they are triggered by the accumulation of microalgae near the free surface. Actually, this microalgae, to develop them themselves, need sunlight, of course, to perform photosynthesis. Therefore, they will tend to accumulate near the free surface of water. Because these are actually an important food source for copepods, when copepods are hungry, they will tend to migrate upwards to try to feed on them. However, they will only do so at night, because during the day, there are some visual predators, such as fishes, that have actual eyes and actual visual capabilities, and therefore have a big advantage over copepods to predate on them. To escape these predators, copepods will tend to migrate back downward to reach the safety of the darkness of the ocean depth in the, when, the, when the sun goes up. Therefore, this vertical migration actually occur twice a day, one up, one down, and occur on very large distances, so over a few hundred meters, that would correspond to us, compared to their size, to as if we swam 10 marathons a day. Okay, so we first noticed that this copy was actually performing dial vertical migrations, and that they are able to react to the local storm. So the question that we're interested in here is, can they use this flow information to actually optimize, in this context of vertical migration, their navigation through the water column? And so that is the question, the scientific question, that we'll try to answer in this study throughout this uh, presentation. Of course, we're not the first one to actually try to answer a similar question, or even this question and different approaches could be used. First of all, we could have, uh, we could try to just observe plankton organisms to try to see how they behave and use some simple models for their behavior. But we could also try to use reinforcement learning approaches to try to learn a strategy for this navigation problem in simulated environment, for instance. However, here we will have a different approach, a physics-based approach will show that this navigation problem actually has an approximate analytical solution that I'm going to present in this presentation. But before getting there, let's formulate properly this vertical plankton vertical migration problem into a proper navigation problem that we can try to, <coughs> to solve afterwards. So first of all, to formalize this problem, we will need to <coughs> introduce a flow velocity film that will be noted U throughout this presentation. Now, if we focus a bit more on our planktonic organism, we will need to state a few assumptions to, for the planktonic organism we actually consider. The first assumption is that we will consider all our planktonic organism very small compared to the smallest scale of the film. That said, if we now zoom in, we have, uh, we will note x, the position of our planktonic organism, p, its swimming direction, corresponding to its orientation, then we will further assume that all our planktonic organisms are actually spherical, that they are neutrally buoyant, and that they are inertial. That said, we can also state some assumptions on their active behavior, and we will say that they always swim at a constant swim, constant swimming velocity, they swim here, and uh, they will be able to sense the flow velocity gradients around them and the vertical V, for example, through light sensing with their rudimentary eye. Note that because of their definition, they are carried by the flow. So there is no way they can actually directly measure the flow velocity field, flow velocity field directly. And that's why we will assume that can only measure flow velocity differences that correspond to the gradient of flow velocity. <clears throat> then they will be able to react to their sensing, to their local flow sensing, by choosing a preferred swimming direction that will be called N. But in practice, it takes a certain time to actually go from your actual swimming direction P to your preferred swimming direction N. 
But for now, we will assume that uh, instantaneous rotation happen. So as a function of their current setting, they will be able to directly choose their swimming direction at any point in time. Under the limit of all these assumptions, the equation of motion for our planktonic organism can be written in this, with this very simple advection equation with an active term corresponding to the swimming velocity times the preferred swimming direction. We'll do a final assumption here. We'll assume that all our planktonic organisms that we consider are actually memories. This means that they will only be able to choose their preferred swimming direction at any point in time as a function of the current measure of the flow velocity gradient and the target direction d. Okay, so now we stated the model for our planktonic organisms. We need to describe the navigation problem. And so that's what we will do right here. And actually it can be stated in a very simple way. Our aim is to find the optimal preferred swimming direction n such that the vertical displacement is actually maximized. To assess the performance of any simulated planktonic organism in the following, we will use the effective migration velocity to characterize performance of, on this uh, navigation problem. Okay, so now we stated the navigation problem. Let's try to find a solution to this navigation problem. Okay, here we go with our navigation problem again. And the first thing that we can start with is, for instance, the, the equation of motion. However, here we already face a problem because this flow velocity field in, the, in our complex case is highly nonlinear, right? So this this uh, equation of motion actually is kind of hard to, to, to integrate it to try to solve our navigation problem. So the, th the first thing that we can do is, rather than trying to optimize our vertical migration problem on the whole duration of the migration, we can try to optimize this vertical navigation problem, but on a shorter time scale, a local time scale. And if we do so, we are able to denearize the flow velocity field. This flow velocity field is now characterized by a flow velocity at the origin, a constant flow velocity gradient, and a constant acceleration. That said, we obtain a linear formulation of our flow velocity field that is easy, that we can inject in our equation of motion here to integrate analytically this equation of motion. Now that we are able to integrate this equation of motion, one thing that we can do is try to uh, describe the vertical displacement as a function of our control, the thing that we will try to optimize, the preferred swimming dimension n. And if we do so, this is what we obtain. So that's a horrible expression for sure, but one thing that we can notice here is that our control, the preferred swimming direction, only appears in this single term. Therefore, if we want to use this control to actually optimize our our navigation to optimize our vertical displacement, we don't need to care about these other terms and we only have to care about this one. The problem then, this navigation problem, reduces to the simple maximization of this term. However, maximizing this integral is actually the same as maximizing the integrant at any point in time. Okay, so the problem further reduces uh, and is actually the maximization of a scalar product between two vectors. Okay, that said, we are not really interested to, uh, to know the optimal swimming direction, our optimal, uh, what, what, what we would need to do in the future. We're actually only interested in what we have to do right now, right? Therefore, we can set t to zero and we obtain, and the problem further reduces to the maximization of this kind of problem. Finally, we can rewrite this kind of product in a more convenient way by introducing the transpose of the flow velocity gradient. And the, the final problem consists on finding the optimal swimming, preferred swimming direction n that maximizes this kind of product. The solution for this to be maximum is n to be collinear to this vector here, right? So this actually formulates our solution to this linear navigation problem that is the following that thinks our control the preferred swimming direction as a function of the measures that the plankton can do of its environment. It takes the form of a matrix exponential of the transpose of the flow velocity gradient. And we can note that we have a parameter here that is 
uh, that is uh, tau, this tau here, and that corresponds to the duration for which we can trust our linearization. Of course, our linearization will break down at some point, and this is this duration here. So, overall, the surfing strategy can be stated like this. It's based on a local optimization over a time horizon tau. It is the main result of the study, and tau is actually the, this duration tau is actually the only free parameter of our strategy because we don't really know which value to set it, so we'll have to try a few of them uh, because this, uh, the, the, the duration for which the linearization breaks down actually will depend on flow properties, so we cannot really assume a value for it. Therefore, in the following, we'll have a systematic approach. We'll just try to a uh, bunch of different values for this parameter of the surfing strategy to find the optimal one that will maximize vertical migration. Okay, so now we have a surfing strategy that, was, that seems to work, at least theoretically. Now let's try to evaluate how this surfing strategy actually performs in actual flows. Okay, before getting to more complex flows, we'll try in a simple 2D flow, a 2D Taylor green flow, and we'll try to see what happens here. But to compare the surfing strategy to, uh, with, we will use a baseline strategy that will be always swimming upwards, just to have a reference. Okay, this strategy will be called the bottom heavy strategy because it can easily be achieved by plankton organisms just by having a more heavy bottom part of their body than the up part of their body. Then the, the weight will actually re tend to reorient them uh, towards the vertical. That said, here is what we obtain if I put such a naive strategy of always swimming upwards in such a flow. So we can see that it's able to go a bit upwards, however the flow will push it in a downstream region of the flow, and it will not be able to overcome this downstream region and will be trapped in this vortex. However, if I put the surfer here, it's coming, hopefully, and here we go. We can see that the surfer is actually able to avoid this downstream region and try to even forage upward, upward region of the flow to actually uh, migrate very effectively upwards, right? Okay, so this is a very nice illustration. However, the actual environment of plankton organism is actually turbulent. So we need to do this, but in a turbulent flow. In a turbulent flow, rather look like this, right? Okay, so this is actually a non-line open access simulation that comes from the John Hopkins turbulence databases. And so this is actually the flow that we will, we will use in the following to assess the performance of our surfing strategy. Okay, here I show in red the flow velocity that is going upward. I show in blue the flow velocity that goes downward. So you can already understand why navigating such a flow can be interesting because if we are able to find these red patches, the flow will carry us upward, and we will be able to move more efficiently upwards, right? However, here I show the flow velocity, but as we said, plankton organisms that do not have access to the, uh, to the actual flow velocity, they have access to the local flow velocity gradients. So their vision of the flow rather looks like this, where I show here the flow vorticity. And we can see that on this uh, movie, uh, we highlight by showing the flow vorticity, Small, some very small features of turbulence that are actually very characteristic of turbulent flows. Okay, these very small features are characterized by what we call the Kolmogorov scales, and that we will note for the length scale eta, for the time scale of these structures tau eta, and for the velocity scale of these structures u eta. And uh, because we expect our surfing st strategy to actually surf on these very small scales of turbulence, these small features of turbulence, as they, as they did in the Taylor Green flow, we'll use these scales that characterize these small features, these Kolmogorov scales, to rescale all our results in the following. Okay, so now we have a flow simulation to try to, to see if surface can be performant in such a strategy. However, we need a code to integrate trajectories in that flow simulation. And uh, to do so, I've developed my own open source solver written in C++, and it's the main principle of this solver is actually to do our simulation in Marseille. We have to send 
the position of all our planktonic simulated planktonic organism and the time uh, of the current simulation to the open source database that is situated in the states. And from the database, we get the flow velocity at the position of our planktonic organism and the flow velocity gradient also at the position of our simulated planktonic organism. Then we can use this information to try to update the position of our planktonic organism and then if we do this repeatedly, it will integrate a trajectory. The integration part itself is actually done by using a fourth order Wunschkutta term. And even though we will mostly use this open source uh, flow database here, uh, we, will, we can actually use our code to use own our own local flow database to achieve different simulation with different Reynolds numbers. Okay, we have a code, we have a flow simulation. Let's see what happens if you put some particles inside that simulation. I start here with passive particles, so particles that absolutely have no behavior, and we can see that the turbulent flow is actually dispersing the particle cloud anywhere isotropically in, uh, in space. However, if I put some bottom-heavy particles, so I remind bottom-heavy particles at our swimmers that always swim upwards, we can see the same dispersive effect. However, we can see an upward drift that is due to actual uh, swimming upwards, right? If now I put some surfer inside here, we can see exactly the, the same dispersive effect due to dividends, but we can see that the upward drift that we obtain, even though the swimming velocity is the same here than here, is actually greater than bottom heavy stretches. So already qualitatively, we can see that surf surfers, I will call them surfers, are actually able to migrate more efficiently upwards than, uh, than just bottom heavy swimmers. But as I said before, I had to state a certain value of our parameter of our strategy. And this value is kind of arbitrary. And uh, to obtain the optimal value of this parameter, to obtain the maximal performance of surfing, we need to try a lot of different values and select the best one. So that's exactly what I'm going to do in the following. So I did a lot of this simulation. And I will compute for each one of the simulation the average effective migra migration speed for each of the trajectories. And then I will average, and I will normalize it by the swimming velocity. I will plot this as a function of the parameter of our strategy, the parameter tau, that will be renormalized, that will be, sorry, rescaled by the Kolmogorov of time scale. OK. Note that a value of 1 here, that means that we are actually able to go as fast as our swimming velocity. But a value of 2 here means that we are actually able to swim effectively upward twice as fast our, as our own swimming velocity. And if I put our results here, this is typically what we obtain. So if we start from a parameter uh, tau of 0, we can see that we have a performance of 1, but performance will increase when this time horizon increases until a maximum is reached around 2 for a, an optimal parameter tau of around 4 or 5. And we can see that if we further increase this, this uh, time horizon, we can see that surfing performance actually drops because we are anticipating too much compared to the actual duration of validity of our linearization we did to compute the surfing strategy. OK, so that's, that's already nice. This means that actually, in the best cases, surfing can actually double our migration speed. However, we have another parameter to play with. And this is actually the swimming velocity of our planktonic organism. If I try to increase the swimming velocity and do exactly the same protocol, we obtain this. So we obtain, we, we can see two effects. First of all, the swimming the performance of the surfing strategy is actually decreasing. I will get back to it later. The second thing that we can see is that the performance for which uh, the, the surfing time horizon tau, the parameter of our strategy for which this performance is maximal, actually shifted from a value of 4 or 5 to a value of, of 3. So it changes with the swimming velocity, right? And this can be easily understood because because when a uh, uh, plankton is actually swimming faster in our flow velocity field, then the flow around it will tend to change faster, right? So the linearization that we need will also break down faster. And because 
the, the, the optimal time horizon here corresponds to the actual duration for which this narration holds, then, the, 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 then we obtain this, uh, this shift here. So now to characterize properly the surfing performance as a function of swimming velocity, we can exactly do exactly the same protocol for a lot of different swimming velocity and extract from these plots the maximal performance for each swimming velocity and we'll be able to measure surfing performance as a function of swimming velocity. And so that's exactly what I've got here. And we can see for low swimming velocities, we obtain a maximal performance, sorry, of two, meaning that we're able to double our migration speed. However, when swimming velocity increases, the, the sorry, the surfing performance is actually de slowly decreasing until when we are swimming very, very, very fast compared to our, um, to uh, the common growth scale, we can see that performance decrease up to one. And why is that? It's simply just because even if we are able to actually extract and exploit the flow velocity, if we are actually going very fast to compare to that flow velocity, even if we are able to exploit it, I mean, the benefit we would get from it would be marginal compared to our own swimming velocity. And that's actually why we obtain this performance drop when swimming velocity increases, because this definition of our performance return, right? Of course, uh, sorry about that. Of course, uh, we can also do this for our, uh, for bottom heavy swimmers, and we can see that independently of the swimming speed, bottom heavy swimmers will always swim as fast as their own swimming velocity, meaning that the turbulence is just acting as some noise that will disperse bottom heavy swimmers around this average. So they cannot, uh, exploit the flow to actually perform as better as uh, surfing uh, simulated tactic organisms. However, these results are actually obtained in a quite an ideal uh, um, vision of a planktonic organism. So we need to try to relax some of the assumptions that we did when we stated our model for a planktonic organism to assess the robustness of the surfing strategy when we relax these assumptions. And maybe the strongest assumption that we did was that uh, we actually reorient instantaneously. So what happens if we introduce a finite time reorientation? However, the time to reorient actually depends on the mechanism that induces this reorientation. And if we start with a bottom heavy planktonic organism, what is actually reorienting that bottom heavy planktonic organism is actually the combination of the weight and the flow buoyancy that doesn't apply in the same point because of this inhomogeneity in mass inside that plankton organism, and this will create a torque that will tend to reorient that uh, plankton organism uh, towards the vertical. Uh, using this understanding, this physical process, we can compute the characteristic time for this rotation to occur and we can deduce it from the physical properties of the functional organism and the physical properties of the fluid. That said, we can do exactly the same for something, for a plankter, sorry, that is actually uh, reorienting activity, but the forces changes, but we can also compute the characteristic reorientation time from the physical properties of that plankter organism. Okay, because now we are not reorienting Instantaneously, we need to take into account that the flow vorticity will tend to reorient also our plankton organism. That said, this, uh, this, uh, the, 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 sorry, the orientation of our plankton organism can now be described by this equation that describes the orientation, with this term corresponding to the flow induced flow vorticity induced uh, torque, and this term actually corresponds to the reorientation torque. That will depend on, uh, that will be, de that has the same form for either an active orientation and, um, and uh, bottom heaviness, but will just change the value of this time characteristic reorientation time, that one line. Okay, so now we have another, a new parameter to play with. So let's just see how surfing performs as a function of this uh, reorientation. So let's see what happens here. So I, I also put the migration perform, performance here as a function of the reorientation time here. And we can see that when this reorientation time increases, 
both for bottom heavy swimmers and surfers, actually, the performance, the migration performance drops. And this is, this is easy to understand because if we, if this reorientation time increases, then flow vorticity will have much more in, uh, much more important influence on our reorientation and will tend to tilt us away from the actual swimming direction, uh, our preferred swimming direction where we actually want to go. Okay, so, but the, another thing that we can see is that for any time horizon, for the same time horizon, for the bottom heavy and for a surfer, we can see that surfing, the surfing strategy actually always outperforms a bottom heavy time frame progression. So, of course, migration, uh, of course, uh, surf, uh, migration performance is impacted by in this reorientation time. However, we can say that surfing is robust to this finite reorientation time because it always uh, outperforms another, this other strategy. Okay. Uh, okay, so this concludes uh, our discussion about robustness. And uh, now let's come back to our uh, planktonic organism, our biophysical planktonic organism, and see how relevant this strategy actually is for our uh, for typical planktonic organism that we can find in the ocean. Okay, to answer this question, how beneficial would the surfing strategy be for actual planktons in the ocean? We will consider three typical planktonic organisms. We will start with a copper bud that has these physical properties. We will also use an invertebrate larva, and we will also use a dinoflagellate. So that's the very small thing that we can see here. Okay, so we have three very different uh, length scales, and from these physical properties, we can compute the characteristic reorientation time as if they are of reorienting actively as if they were surfing or as if they were reorienting passively using bottom heavy. Using this parameter and this swimming velocity, we have everything we need to actually estimate the performance of these uh, organisms using our numerical data that we uh, computed and that I presented just previously, right? Okay, so we will use our numerical data to built up some empirical models to estimate the surfing performance and see how this performance scales for each one of these typical plankton organisms. However, now the swing velocity is fixed and the reorientation times are also fixed by the physical properties of our plankton organism. So the thing that then will vary in the following is actually turbulent intensity that will change based on the characteristic habitat of these organisms, okay? So that's exactly what I'm going to show here. Well, I'm uh, again plotting the migration performance as a function, this time of turbulence intensity that is characterized here by the turbulence dissipation rate. Note that for each one of these turbulent dissipation rates corresponds a value of the Kolmogorov velocity and a value of the Kolmogorov time. Okay? When we increase turbulence intensity, we can see that the Kolmogorov velocity is is actually increasing, but the Kolmogorov of time is actually decreasing. Okay, now we just have to map the characteristic plankton habitats of plankton corresponding to the characteristic uh, turbulence intensity we can find in these habitats, and uh, we, can, we can start at low levels of turbulence intensity in the open ocean, but the, the closer we'll get to the coast, the larger will be turbulence intensity. Okay, so now we have everything. We'll use our numerical data to assess the performance of, we'll start with bottom heavy swimmers in as a function of turbulent intensity to obtain it in different habitats. And this is what we obtain. So for <laughs> low turbulent intensities, we can see that bottom heavy planktonic organisms are actually able to stay upright and to move effectively upward as fast as their own swimming velocity. However, when turbulent intensity increases, flow vorticity becomes much and much stronger and the Kolmogorov of time is actually decreased. This causes our bottom heavy planktonic orga organism to actually tilt away from the vertical and this decreases the performance as what we saw uh, when, we, uh, when we discussed about the reorientation time. Okay, if we now put some surfing planktonic organism in here, we can see uh, that the migration, of uh, migration speed 
performance uh, for this surfing uh, planktonic organism would be, at best, uh, much better than bottom heavy swimmers, independently of the habitat, actually. We observe exactly the same effects here uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our surfers, because flow elasticity becomes too strong when turbulence intensity becomes very strong. And here we obtain the, the first effect that we observe, because here the swimming velocity of our planktonic organism becomes very large compared to the common goal of velocity for small turbulence intensities. Okay, so we also observe a drop for the copepods and for the invertebrate larva, just because uh, there is actually no flow to be exploited because the flow is too small. Okay, so this demonstrates that surfing would be beneficial for actual plankton organisms in actual plankton habitats in the ocean. Okay, but we didn't answer this question. We, we don't know if planktons uh, are actually surfing or not. To, to demonstrate this, we have to look at experiments where we are able to measure what's the behavior of our planktonic organism and try to see if it's actually surfing or not. That said, thank 44S, there are some experiments that is out there, and so I'm going to focus on, ex on an experiment of Michel Di Benedetto, that is here present as a member of the jury online, and that focused on the Crepiduna fornicata larvae. Okay, so this larvae actually expected to migrate upwards at the early stages of their life to try to disperse as much as possible to find different uh, settlement areas to, to settle. Of course, at the late stage of their life, they are expected to migrate downward to try to find a place to settle and form these very nice shells. Note that in the following, uh, the following is actually an ongoing collaboration with Michel Di Benedetto, so these results are not completely fine. Okay, so what is the experiment? We have a turbulent tank here, where turbulence is actually forced by pulsing diffuse jets, and in which we put some down. Then the measures are actually performed uh, using a camera that films uh, the center plane of the, of, the, uh, of the tank that is illuminated using a laser sheet. And from these measurements can be deduced the flow velocity field using particle image velocimetry and the trajectories of our planktonic organism that are this Crepiduna fornicata larvae. Okay, one very interesting thing that we can extract from these simulations, uh, from these experiments, sorry, uh, is actually the slip velocity that is defined as the actual velocity of that larvae. No, that larva, sorry, minus the difference between its actual velocity and the flow velocity that is interpolated at the position of that larva. Okay? Because we can show that this larva is actually not inertial, we can actually show that this slip velocity is a fair proxy of the swimming velocity, and therefore its direction is a fair proxy of the swimming direction of this larva. Okay, that said, how, now that we have, we know that we have the uh, information about the orientation of this planktonic organism, how can we differentiate uh, uh, surfing-like behavior from a bottom-heavy uh, behavior, a simple bottom-heavy behavior? To try to understand that, let's consider a bottom-heavy planktonic organism in a simple vortex flow with this kind of vorticity. Vorticity will tend to reorient our uh, planktonic organism, and therefore well, and our bottom heavy plankton will tend to rotate on the right here with this kind of vorticity. Okay? Until the point where the bottom heavy torque will try to balance this flow vorticity, and kind of a, a balance will be found, but still the orientation will be oriented in that way. Right? If now I put a, surfing, uh, a surfer in such a simple vortex flow, because the upward flow velocity is actually in this direction, the surfer would actually try to rotate in the opposite direction of flow vorticity, and then we'll obtain an opposite correlation here for the same flow vorticity. Just to be sure about this result, what we can do is try to run, to use all our numerical simulation that we already did, and try to compute the, the statistics of this projection, horizontal projection, 
of uh, this orientation. And that's actually what we did here. Well, I've got this average uh, horizontal projection of the swimming direction as a function of vorticity. You can indeed see a positive correlation for bottom happy swimmers and a negative correlation for surfing simulated plankton organisms, right? Okay, so this confirms that this observable is actually a nice way to differentiate these two behaviors. So let's just see what happens in experiments, and this is what we obtain, right? So in the experiments of Michel. And, uh, and so we observe exactly the same negative correlation here. That would seem like this larvae would actually uh, have a surfing-like behavior. Okay, so this might be the first experimental observation of this surfing behavior, but it's still ongoing research and we have still a few things to clarify before claiming that for sure. Okay, so now let's just summarize what we learned here and talk a bit about perspective. So first of all, we formalize properly the navigation problem of the plankton vertical migration. Then we derived an approximate analytical solution to this problem that we, where we, and we demonstrated its performance, <coughs> its high performance in turbulence. Then we came back to biophysics and we demonstrated that this strategy is actually relevant for actual planktonic organisms in the habitat, right? Okay, that said, this, uh, this uh, presentation actually included of this, uh, this point, but my PhD thesis actually includes quite a discussion about quite uh, other elements too, and we can note a deeper analysis of robustness of the surfing strategy, comparison to other navigation approaches, and other considerations such as trying to be, to navigate energy efficiently that has not been considered here. Okay, that said, let's talk a bit about perspective. And maybe the best, the, 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 the more obvious perspective that we have here is that we can generalize the surfing strategy, okay? When we derived our surfing strategy, we stopped at the first order Theodore expansion, that was the linearization. But we don't have to actually stop there. We can actually continue to add orders to our Theodore expansion until we reach infinity. And if we do so, we actually not obtain an approximate optimal solution, we, but we obtain an actual optimal solution to this navigation problem. However, this, uh, this solution relies on higher order time derivative of the flow velocity gradient, and this means that if we don't have memory, we won't be able to actually measure this, uh, this, uh, this thing. But overall, the surfing strategy that I presented in this, uh, throughout this presentation is actually a first order approximation of uh, an actually optimal strategy to this navigation problem, and uh, so it's relatively easy to generalize and expand this surfing strategy if we have more information from the flow, such as memory or higher order spatial measures of the flow. Okay, now that in a similar way can be generalized so that we could include uh, uh, to, to try to, uh, to solve other different kinds of navigation problems. For instance, we could try to reach a positional target, but if we do so, we need to uh, consider that our target direction is actually changing in time. But if we do so, we could adapt this expression to solve this kind of problem. So overall, uh, in uh, my perspectives, some, some other perspective of my study of vertical migration of plankton organism, we know that we, uh, an easy way to, to continue this study would be to try to fit some more physical properties of our plankton organism so that our model becomes more close from actual reality. So for example, considering shape, but also inertia, finite size effects, some of which are already treated in my thesis, but we could also try to include buoyancy or even combine bottom heaviness with active reorientation. And uh, if we include enough of these terms, maybe we're actually able to upscale our strategy to other larger organisms that also have to face some similar navigation problems. Okay, but Including a lot of complexity in our simulation is kind of hard and we kind of reach the limits of simulation. But one thing that we can do, even though everything I did was applied to 
to plant your organisms, we actually, this strategy can, is readily implementable in any autonomous device. Okay, so we could use to, we could implement this strategy in, uh, in uh, micro drones, for instance, and perform experiments to see how the, this strategy actually performs with a more realistic configuration of this strategy. Okay, another branch of the perspective would be to do more simulation, more, more experiments, sorry, to, uh, to try to, to assess which plant organisms are actually surfing and which are not. And another branch would be to adapt, of course, this surfing uh, strategy to other navigation problems, such as reaching a biodiminescent target, trying to disperse horizontally for an RV that needs to settle, or even trying to, to follow a chemical trait to find a mate. And in a very long-term, I would say, uh, perspective would be that all this kind of problem, all this kind of navigation problem of planktonic uh, organism, this planktonic navigation problem, actually depends on the, the intrinsic navigation properties of, of, uh, of uh, turbulent flows, and therefore trying to study and characterize this kind of objects that characterize the expected flow velocity gradient as a function of a current measure of this uh, gradient would be an interesting thing to try to characterize and explain what we learned here. I'd just like to finish by saying that everything that I did is open source, so you can find it uh, from uh, my code, my thesis, and my defense, so you can find it online, and that a video game has been made to vulgarize this main idea in, uh, that I presented here. Thanks a lot.